to North Brooklyn High School where I do costuming with the drama department. I specialize in historical costumes, which brings us to today's topic, fashion history. <laughs> Um, now, obviously, we can't cover all of fashion history in a month, much less an hour. So this is going to be a brief overview. <laughs> um, we're going to mainly be focusing on European and American fashions, and specifically that of women, because it's easier to see the differences and the changes from year to year. Um, so I guess before we really get going, let's go over some terms. <laughs> so first up is a chemise. This is kind of like the base layer. So that's like the base thing that you would wear underneath your corset or your stays, anything else. Um, they're typically made of linen, linen and cotton, and they are to protect your skin from rubbing against the corset and to protect the corset from the oils and stuff on your skin. Um, next up is corsets and stays. Um, so on the left, you have a pair of stays. They're meant to hold everything in and they lace in the front and back. They have straps and they have tabs at the bottom. On the right is a pair, or it is a corset from the 1860s, and you, that's meant to more accentuate your curves and stuff rather than flatten you out. Um, it, close, it laces in the back, but it opens in the front with a steel busk, which is a closure method. Um, petticoats, these were worn all throughout, <laughs> pretty much. Um, on the left, you have a Victorian one, some more Victorian ones in the middle. On the right is some 1950s ones. I'm actually wearing a petticoat right now. <laughs> yeah. Um, so let's start off in England in the 1590s, if, because this is where stays really got popular and widely used. As you can see from <laughs> these portraits, there's Nothing in the front. <laughs> um, in the 18th century, moving fast, sorry. 18th century, so 1700s, you have a lot of flowiness, um, a lot of volume in the skirts, some trains, lots of bows, lots of frills, feathers, very ornate. Um, in France, in the late 1700s, you have the Rococo style, which, just picture Marie Antoinette, that's this. <laughs> um, the skirts were very wide, everything was super duper ornate. I mean, just, just look at it. <laughs> um, yeah. Right here is Madame Pompadour, she was a hallmark of this style. And I think this one, that one I know for sure, and I think this one as well, are Marie Antoinette. So, yeah. Um, ironically, coming right off of that is the chemise à Lorraine, which was kind of like the beginning of cottage court, pretty much. <laughs> um, it was like, it, it was an aesthetic, and the these rich aristocrats would kind of like go to the countryside, their little cottage in the countryside, wear these really simple frocks and pretend that they were witches in the forest pretty much. <laughs> Not particularly like that, but it was very similar to modern day cottage court. Um, it's a lot simpler <laughs> than the Rococo, as we clearly see. Um, next up is the Regency period. It starts in the 1790s. And it started in France among the youth because they really, really, really wanted to get away from the ideals of the aristocracy. They wanted everything to be completely simple. You don't really get a lot of color until like the 1800s or so. Um, everything is like really white in the beginning. Over here on the left, you can see like towards the beginning of this period, everything was really rounded all the way around. Um, you have a lot of gathers like everywhere, <laughs> but as we move on in the period, as you see in the middle there, it and everything eventually gets gathered towards the back instead. Um, and then that diagram right there is of a bib front dress, which is a popular type of closure at the time. So where basically you have your dress, it would button right here, 
and you would pull some drawstrings up, attach the over bodice right here, and then tie the strings in the back to the coat. Um, and then over on the far right, you have some stuff from the 1820s, which you can see there's not really any trains anymore. Everything's really rounded. The hems have gotten a little tiny bit shorter. Puff sleeves are huge. You can see the waistline has moved down quite a bit. Yeah. <laughs> and that directly segues us into, well, front face and corsets, apparently. I forgot about that one. <laughs> um, so, naturally, like in the 1700s, people were wearing stays, which kept everything like close together, or close to you, rather. And, yeah, but as we go into the 18 hundreds, um, people don't really need this support down here anymore. And so the stays started getting shorter, as you can see right here. These are called transitional stays. They have cuffs. They still have caps. Um, and then as we get fully into the Regency era, you have Regency stays, which are just short, <laughs> basically cut off right here, because that's all you needed the support for. You didn't need it to smooth out right here anymore because the waistline is up here. Um, and then these are some from the 1820s, and it's as that waistline is dropping down, you start to need the support down here again. Uh, Regency court dress. <laughs> it looks ridiculous, right? <laughs> so um, in England, you could not present yourself in front of the court of the king or the queen unless you were following the rules that they had set down for fashion. Unfortunately, the <laughs> um, Queen Charlotte has kept the rules from the 1700s into the Regency period. And so if you wanted to go to the English court and you were a woman, you had to wear the, the big hoop skirts, or the wide skirts rather, had to be very ornate, but you still wanted to be fashionable. <laughs> and so what resulted is this really weird little <laughs> yeah. Um, so it's it entire waistline, obviously, but it looks like you're wearing a table. <laughs> 1830s. So this was what I thought we were directly segueing into, sorry. <laughs> um, and you can see it is, you can kind of see how that goes from the 1820s to the 1830s. The sleeves just got bigger, much bigger. Um, <laughs> Skirts got a little bit more fuller, a little bit flowier, and the hems got shorter. As you can see with this lady right here, her ankle was exposed. <laughs> um, that would have been scandalous any time before that. Um, yeah, and the sleeves got so big that over on the bottom right hand corner there, you can see the undergarments that they wore. You can see they have the long corset, or stays effectively, but they also have these weird things on the shoulders. Those are sleeve supports, so your sleeves wouldn't cave in. <laughs> and and you, you can see with this one right here, just how big they got. It was, oh my goodness. <laughs> 1840s, it's kind of a transitional transition area, or period. So it's still kind of just getting away from the Regency period more and more. As you can see, it doesn't really resemble anything of the Regency period. It doesn't, not that I can tell anyway, I have really a style of its own. It's kind of like a mix between the 1830s and the 1850s and 60s. Speaking English. <laughs> so, um, start off with the other arms, I guess. The corset from the beginning. Um, yeah, as you can see, the stage really wanted like that hourglass waist or hourglass figure, kind of like a wasp shape kind of. And then to get these big skirts, they would wear hoop skirts or crinolines, which is like that. Um, yeah, this was like American Civil War era. Um, yeah. So those on the bottom right down there are evening gowns, which is why the neckline is lower. Most women would have it during the daytime anyway, buttoned up to here. <laughs> yeah. 1870s, we start to get trains again. So, 
it's no longer really, really round. It's starting to go more and more into this bustle, which is kind of the gathering fabric right under the back. And so this is what the undergarments look like for that. It's still a crinoline, it's just weird. <laughs> yeah. um, and then in 1880, there's still bustles, but we've kind of gone away from the train. So it, it's kind of, it's, it's weird. <laughs> um, yeah, and then right here, there's kind of like a mini crinoline. That's called a bum pad, technically. And it was just, <laughs> I know. It's just to keep everything looking like the way you want it. Okay, 1890s, you can see it looks drastically different. The sleeves are huge some places, and some places not so huge. Um, a line skirt is back in fashion, not really any crinolines anymore. Um, yeah, I didn't have a picture of it, but the corsets had actually moved down to like the end of it was like down here, and they start right about here. It's kind of weird, but yeah, this is like beginning of the turn of the century. And this one right here is a bicycling outfit because it was not safe to bike in long skirts. <laughs> so the 1900s, this is fully in the Industrial Revolution. Yes, the Gibson girl look is really popular right now. The hair is really big and swirly up top. Lots of hats. Um, it was right here, it looks a bit weird, right? Um, what was really popular back then was the S-curve. You can kind of see it kind of looks like an S. Um, this right here is called the pigeon breast look. And they would achieve that through padding with their corsets right about here, on the hip, etc. You'll notice that this lady's waist looks really tiny. There, there's some myth started somewhere that people were just smaller back then. This is not true. If you look at photos from the time, as I provided several, the backgrounds behind these ladies are pretty plain, right? That was so they could alter their waists. They used Photoshop even back then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so her waist was not actually this small. Hers was certainly not this small. <laughs> hmm. 1910s, this is like Titanic era. Um, we have some evening gowns right here. The pigeon breast look is still kind of in fashion, just not quite as drastic. Um, everything's kind of graduating towards more of a masculine kind of look, to where the waist isn't quite as accentuated, and yeah. Nineteen twenties. So. You might be thinking, how did we get from heads down to the ankles to this? And the answer is we did not go there quite as quickly as you might think. Um, in the early 1920s, the skirts, the hems were actually much shorter, as you can see from up there. And then gradually, they rose, and then towards the end of the decade, they actually came back down again. Not quite as far as they were before, but like mid shin Now let's go through what's not 1920s, <laughs> because this bothers me every single time I go to a Halloween store. So, fringe was really expensive. <laughs> you would not have entire dresses covered in fringe. No. And the skirts would not, absolutely would not have gone above your knee. The only reason your knee would be showing is if you were sitting down and your dress right up a little bit, or if you were a costume. <laughs> and so feathers and headbands wasn't a thing. <laughs> now the 1930s. Um, Great Depression era. 
So women had to like work with what they already had pretty much. So the hens dropped a little bit more, or continued a little bit, I guess. I don't know. Fine. Um, hen lines rose. I didn't mention this for some reason, but in the 1920s, the waistlines were down like right here at the waist, but they rose quite a bit, like to natural waistlines in the 1930s. Um, we have some swimsuits from the time, some women wearing pants, and what I thought was adorable was, so there were fabric shortages, of course, during the Great Depression. And so mothers had to make clothes for their quickly growing children. So they would turn to flower sacks, seed sacks, stuff like that, because it was cheap, they already had it, because they had to buy flour and stuff, and it was a good amount of fabric. When companies realized that women were doing this, they started printing floral patterns <laughs> on their sacks of flour, and the labels would wash out in like a wash or two. And so these, these women like actually had nice fabric to make clothes for their children out of. And there's some examples up there. And I just thought this was really touching how like you can see the patches where this dress was well worn and she's taking great care to repair it. I just thought it was really cute. Nineteen forties. So the whole world went work pretty much. And that leads to more fabric shortages. And so hemlines rose up to about the length, or the height of the point. Um, masculine look went back in with really broad shoulders, like even blouses from the time had shoulder pads. And jackets certainly did. Um, there's some women in trousers because women were entering the workforce in mass. Have some examples of some necklines from the time. And in 1948, Christian Dior releases the new look. And this right here defined the next decade of fashion, which is really impressive. Like think about now, some designer coming out with this something that influences fashion for the next 10 years. Um, but yeah, the Christian Dior's new look was obviously much more flowy, poofier, like what I'm wearing, and the hem was quite a bit shorter than what most women were used to at the time. There were actually protests <laughs> against this new look. Yeah, um, there's it in color and not on a person. So I have the 50s separated in two because they kind of like drastically changed towards the end. So the early mid 50s is pretty much what you would expect from typical 1950s. So it's the circle skirts, it's the fancy dresses, they're all fancy, but it's fine. <laughs> um, yeah. Pencil skirts were also a thing in like the early 50s. They're still a thing in like the 60s and on, but they do exist. They're just not quite as well known. Um, women were commonly wearing trousers and stuff now. It, it kind of became a thing in stuff in the 40s. So, and then there's some women at the beach. Now, the late 50s, early 1950s, I actually have this pattern. Um, <laughs> so, previously, the skirts were cut in gores, which means basically they were cut in triangles. So, like, you would have a triangle piece, several of those would be patched together and make a circle skirt. These are gathered, which means there's a lot more material at the waist, and it's just one giant rectangle that you sew together and you gather it like that. It's like going in the front. Um, but yeah, lots of examples of that. Um, this was the first time, or yeah, pretty much, that teens were mainly focused on. So like you would have patterns advertising specifically to teens which was kind of a big thing, because before, fashion was kind of advertised like mature women, so. But yeah, lots of that stuff. Um, some patterns, or a lot of patterns actually included both the long, the 
Pull your skirts and the pencil skirts. Walk your pants back in. And then in the later part of the 1960s. Wait, no. Yeah, I knew that. Okay. It's fine. So this is the mod look, which is short for modern. Um, huge fashion influence around the time of this style was twinky. Popularized like the eyeliner underneath your eyes. Look what back is the drop waistline. Um, so that kind of introduces people to like the thing that's called the 40 year rule, where around every 40 years, trends will come back. So 40 years from the 1960s was the 1920s. So drop waistlines. Um, yeah, here's the more examples. Some dresses don't really technically have a waistline, but it's kind of implied. Um, then you have kind of like the hippie flower child, very typical 1960s. Yeah, I. <laughs> this is not necessarily my area of expertise, so it's not going to be going quite as in depth here, but. And then you also have rock, pop, crochet. <laughs> I'm, I'm not really sure. It's fine. Um, forgot to mention platform shoes were a huge thing. Yeah. And then you also have like the rock era stuff, like Aerosmith, Queen. And then there's this one brand that's called Gummy Sacks, which makes dresses like this. <laughs> there was a resurgence of colonial stuff in this period because it was the 200th anniversary of the signing of the Declaration of Independence and all. And so that was a huge thing. And also because of the 40 year rule, stuff from the 1930s was also kind of big. So that's why you have the longer skirts and stuff like that. And you have disco. This is Cher. <laughs> she was a huge influence. <laughs> she was known as the queen of pop. Lots of glitter, lots of leather, jumpsuits. <laughs> In the 1980s, you see a resurgence of the 1940s to where they're not all the way, like there's some modern twists obviously, but you have the broad shoulders, kind of like the not so puffy skirts or a line. Now I know that's not what you typically think for the 80s, so <laughs> here is other stuff. Lots of neon, denim, huge hair, big, like bright colors. And you also have the rock and roll aesthetics and even the cartoons. <laughs> yeah, big hair. They look like they would all be loud. Um, a huge style icon of the time was Lady Diana, and she was kind of really fashion forward. <laughs> Always 100% accurate, so it's around every 40 years. So it's like 30 to 50, somewhere in there. Trends start coming back. Um, yep, we have some people pull. Um, you had a lot of bold fashion choices from the 1990s, whether it's denim on denim huge color blocking or really 
bold prints. Um, I just thought it was good to mention TV and media was a huge influence in fashion at the time. So you have Saved by the Bell, Full House, that's more Saved by the Bell, um, Clueless, Friends, obviously, <laughs> and Mean Girls, I don't think you can see too much else, but it's fine. So, now that that's come to an end, I have some kind of satire to share with you, and I want to see if you can tell what's being made fun of. So, this is all made in photos of the same era, so we have my guesses. The 1870s? Close. 1880s. Yeah. <laughs> yep. I like the snail shell. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and the horse. <laughs> Centaur. <laughs> Very astute observation. <laughs> yeah, this one is talking about like different things women are using as fossils. So sometimes books. That one's a bird cage. A drum, a pan. Oh, that's funny. It's great. Storage is important. Save my cell. I'm curious how people would sit. Oh, it, it was just another crinoline. So it would like fold up. Oh. All right. Yeah, they, they weren't like stiff or anything. It was like hoops that were hung on like tape, basically. Oh, okay. Like strips of fabric. So, <laughs> what are we thinking? <laughs> I see the, the pigeon front. Um, the 1890s? Close. Like 1910? Yeah. 1900s, 1910. This one is probably more 1900s. This one is definitely 1910. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, just because like, the Gibson girl was more popular in the 1900s. Big hats. Big hats. Big hat, tiny person. Gosh. Oh, that'd be like the. I found a lot of these. So. <laughs> Is she an umbrella? She's just blowing away. <laughs> I like the one where she got caught on the. Is that she's caught on the door handle or something? Yeah. Um, 1850s and 1860s, right? Yeah. <laughs> That's a social distancing dress. There you go. <laughs> Whoa. I can picture the images, but I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> it's the one with the big sleeves and they have like the puffy things on their corsets. Um, is it the 1890s? Nope. No. I think it was before. I think it's before the, because it was earlier than, it was like 1830s? Yep. Okay. Yeah. This would be. Ankles. I'm really curious about why their sleeves got so big. Like, what was, did they serve a function or? You know, I don't know. I think it might have just been for the aesthetic. Mm, like, the hiding snacks in there or something? <laughs> That's what I would do. <laughs> yeah, and like, a lot of these trends, they just, they got more and more extreme until they could go no further, <laughs> and so then they kind of went out. Like, the Regency waistline started out down here, and it just got higher and higher and higher, until it could go no higher, as we saw in the 1920s, or not 1820s, my bad. And so it just kind of fell back down. And, and again, with, with the hems in the 1920s, they got shorter and shorter, and then they came back down. Same thing with sleeves in the 1830s. I guess it just shows you like that happens these days too. If you mm -hmm. look at like uh, if you look at Fashion Week and you see like how extreme some of those styles are, you know, yeah. it's kind of kind of the same way. <laughs> Whoa, what is going on there? That looks like Marie Antoinette stuff. I meant that. The 1790s? 1780s, but we'll take it. Okay. We'll take it. Okay, what is going on on the second one? Is where the guy is the guy holding up her hair? Yeah. Her yeah. hair yeah. is so big and tall that it's pulling her backwards and he's having to hold it up. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it kind of looks like a collar, but it's her hair. Okay, gotcha. I she has a trendy hat on there. Oh, I see that. <laughs> oh, that would give me a headache. 
because it's flat in the front and in the right. Okay. Like that's when the trains came back. Because the 1870s just had yeah. the bustle by itself, and then in the 1880s, that's when the trains came back. No, is that right? Reverse. 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 1870s had the train. Okay. 1880s got rid of it. Okay, gotcha.